Merry, Merry Christmas, everyone. If you would, if you have a copy of the scriptures, I invite you to open them to Isaiah chapter 9 and Luke chapter 1. I'm going to be reading Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7, and then I'm going to pray and I want to share with you this amazing story, this historical truth of light coming into darkness, starting in Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. The people, oops, there we go. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is God's word for us today. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, Father, we pray as Rashad prayed, as we prayed earlier this morning, Father, that the Holy Spirit would govern all of our thoughts, all of our emotions. Some of us brought anxieties in here this morning. Time with family is filled at times with memories of the past, longings for the future, and the space of unmet need in between. And God, while we do celebrate this amazing birth today and remember the promise fulfilled in your scriptures, we also must be honest with you that we seek your strength. In this hour, as we work through these scriptures, God, we pray that the kids' hearts would be enlightened and filled with joy, that the adults in this room, all of the adults gathered online and here together today, would see the manger and the cross as the intimate connection of Emmanuel, God with us. It is in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. The writings that we just read were written over 700 years before the birth of Jesus. I think a lot of times for you and for me, we tend to get lost on dates and times, maybe to the point that we we see them dimly at best, much like the fog that we drove through to get here this morning. And we recognize that that distance, that gap may not mean very much to us, but let let me try to set a little quick context here. Imagine being able to finish your life on this earth content, hopeful, carrying joy, and yet having not fully experienced in front of you the fulfillment of the promises that God has made that brought that joy. A lot of times you and I can't connect to that, but imagine being, uh, you know, the night before Christmas, like tonight, imagine going to bed fully happy, fully content, irrespective of the presence to follow the morning after. Imagine that joy of watching kids and family members celebrate the good tidings of Christmas and all of the things that come with it. Tonight, the singing of these these amazing songs, 
the reading of these unbelievably wonderful scriptures. Imagine if all of the things that that were to capture in your heart were always present no matter the physical circumstances around you. Isaiah was laying that into the lap of God's people. And for you and for me today, our lives, for those of you who follow Jesus, for those of you that have discovered the goodness of the gospel and trust it, the hope has already been fulfilled. The joy has already been given. And so you and I, even though our experiences in this life can still seem foggy, the realities do not change. They can't. Because the God who brought those realities brought his son, raised his son, and that son is now seated with him at the right hand, just as was promised long before the experiences in this life happened. Why does that matter? Because as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, for those of you that celebrate the holidays with family and friends, you must let this come to another step in your heart. The words, it is finished, are for you. So whether our experiences here are in and out of medical care facilities, in and out of challenges, at work and at home and in other places we find our time, the great good God of the universe, 700 years before Jesus was born in this earth, 700 years, the plan was already unfolding. The work was already being done as long before and then the days that follow. So you and I get to walk in this in-between space. It's, it's known as the life in between two worlds, the world that is to come that has already been delivered and the world we still yet find that is waiting. We are in the space of the in-between and that in-between is a place of smiling, of laughter, of playfulness and of joy because of the words, it is finished. So I wanna read to you What is it that is finished? You must hear this today. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet, a man sent by the Lord to the Lord's people to speak the clear truths that those people needed to know for the sake of their heart, for the sake of their trust, for the sake of their joy, God sends a word to them. Starting in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Now, some of you may have friends, family, or you are just super big fans of crime shows. And for those of you who are, you would know that police, when arriving at any kind of scene, whether there's confirmation of a crime having been committed or they're still exploring the possibilities contained therein, they have a protocol and a process. And some of you have nerded out on this a lot in your life. And some of you are paid to do that. That's cool. For those of you that are not, that's not cool. It's just weird. But either way, there's a process that all of our law enforcement work through. And and here's kind of a way of understanding it. When When a law enforcement officer arrives on a scene, what they are doing is they are asking this question, what is our situation? As we're reading this text today, I want to take a little bit of time to examine what is our situation? What's the situation here and what is ours today? And in order to do that, these three things have to happen. The first is we have to survey the scene. We just have to take a glimpse around. What are we seeing? What's normal? What's predictable? What's out of place? What's peculiar? What's awkward? What smells funny? All of those things. We want to survey, take a, just a quick glance. We don't arrive at any judgments. We don't arrive at any conclusions. We just survey what objectively is around us. The second thing we must do is we've got to secure it. We can't let it change. If we're going to have an accurate understanding, we can't fiddle with it. So kind of like the Bible, I can't go in here and make it mean what I want. We objectively come to the scriptures. We come to the truth. We see what it says and whatever it says, we deal with what's there. We secure it by not touching it, changing it, or augmenting it in any way. And finally, the third thing that we do, this is what law enforcement would tell you, is they establish scene boundaries. They determine what is the scope. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say something happens on the side of a road, but it's on the side of the road. You might, you might survey the scene and recognize it's on the side of the road. You secure it, but a crowd will start to follow to check out and snoop what's going on. If at that moment, while you're doing the surveying and securing, you recognize that there's some details regarding this little accident on the other side of the street, You have to secure that boundary by going across the street and blocking traffic. Got it? Everybody follow? 
I want to show you how that comes out in this text today. Isaiah chapter 9 is addressing a crime on the human heart brought into the world by the human heart. Even God's people who had been given the law, God's people had been given a picture. Hey, here's how this should go. And yet over the centuries, they didn't hold it very well. And I don't know for some of you, you may have experienced this in your life where you learned of God's love for you. You came to a moment where you trusted, believed, and were totally surrendered to the good news of Jesus. But then months go by And you watch some of the old patterns, old habits, old attitudes are kind of still lingering, sometimes even dominating your thought life. I have all of this hope in Jesus. I have all of this love for God. And yet I still feel a little bit more like the same old kind of person. And in that moment where you have those thoughts capture your attention, you recognize that in-between reality. Longing for things to be totally reconciled, fully finished, fully fulfilled, but also that you get to experience it in all of your thought life. And so when people say things that are harmful to you, you don't become offended. Or when bad things happen in your life, you don't lose hope. Not because you've become apathetic and distant, but because you know that whatever happens in this life, because Jesus raised from the dead, and promise that all that believe in him, that's it, just have faith and trust in him, just that's it, will also have the same outcome for them forever. Living with God at peace forever. Having all the joys and fulfillment of a world fully restored forever. You don't have to strive, build, create, or fight for it on your own. It has been brought to you in the person of Jesus. Starting in a manger, working through a cross, raising from the dead, ascending to the throne, awaiting his bride. This is what we live for. And so this scene in Isaiah chapter nine is very interesting and there's three things I wanna show you that exist in here. What is before chapter nine is a picture of the human heart that we can find in John chapter three. Most of you know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, yes? Just after that, Jesus is still having the same conversation Nicodemus and some disciples are all listening in while Jesus talks about this love of God. But he addresses our situation, something we see in Isaiah chapter 7, 8, and 9, and also something we see every day, sometimes even in the mirror. And it's this, John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Most of you know this. One of the things about darkness that is so troubling is you don't know what's in there. It's why some of you have said unbelievably difficult things when your toe hit the thing that didn't move. Right? What would have solved that? Light. If light would have exposed in the darkness, if light would have exposed things, your toe wouldn't be the same size as your knee. But because those things do happen, all of us recognize, and you've you've seen these things play out in your life at times. How many of you guys, and and keep your hands down for the sake of uh, not exposing people too far for the illustration, but how many of you have noticed that sometimes if you choose to do the right thing, let's say you change your behaviors a little bit, around other people who do not want to do that, do they celebrate your change or do they start to get a little frustrated with you? They get frustrated with you, why? because light is starting to expose things. Let me give you an example of how this plays out. So there's a person that I've been friends with for a long time, um, but they had this this addiction that they just couldn't shake, but it's actually a publicly acceptable uh, addiction. Um, it's, It's not something that is necessarily frowned upon in public spheres at all, okay? And one of the things, and and cigarettes are an example of this. Uh, Maybe some of you guys have noticed this play out where uh, if you go outside with some coworkers on a smoke break, What always happens? They offer you one. Isn't that interesting? Now, if you become a smoker, they're going to tell you to start buying your own. They don't want to share them all the time. Why is that? The day that they offered you that first smoke, they were actually trying to take the darkness and smother your light. Because in that moment, there's guilt. There's a little bit of difference because you're not a smoker and they are. And so there's a risk of feeling shame. There's a a risk of feeling different. So the easiest way to do that is to get you to be like them in the moment. That comforts their guilt. That comforts the risk of light versus darkness. Everybody see that? 
It's real, and it happens everywhere in life. Light is always at war with darkness, and it happens in your home. It happens in places of employment. It happens in the young and in the old alike. It is always present. Light and darkness cannot be friends. But it is also true that light knows no fear of the darkness. Light doesn't show up and get trounced out by the darkness. The text here helps us simply in verse 19. Light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. The goal of light is to come into a space and expose what is needed, what is broken, what is not yet as it should be. One of the reasons we celebrate this on Christmas is because every single one of us who believe in Jesus to the degree, whether it's for many years or just barely at all, a moment happened in your life where you saw the darkness that was real and you also saw the incredible hope of the light that was needed. I remember for me, whenever I was in my late teens and early 20s, I remember I was uh, walking on a college campus having, having just given my life truly to Jesus. And I remember walking and walking and walking and I was so young, I didn't know very much at all. But I remember I had all of this hope and I felt just really confident, not brazen or bold necessarily, but just, you've ever been in those spaces where he just, he's so real and tangible that you can almost like, physically feel his presence manifesting in different ways around you. It's just so rich. And you are also simultaneously still in so much need for it. It's almost like drinking that perfect tempered water that you just drink and it just nourishes you in every single way. So I was walking down this path on a college campus and this guy was walking past me and I just remember I had no evangelism training. I had no like prayer training. I didn't have any training at all really of any consequence. And I just remember all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming love for this person. Like I was, and I had seen him a few times before on campus, but all of a sudden, I was so concerned about everything in his life. Not in some weird, I'm going to follow him around kind of way. That'd be weird and creepy and unnecessary. Don't do that. But I was so desperate for whatever it was I had been given. I was so desperate that he would have it. And I don't know how that plays out for you, but that's what happens in Isaiah 9. I don't think if we read the Bible that we're going to come away with a picture of God passively wishing some good to somehow happen to some people. There's a quote that I've used here before, and I want to share it with you this morning, that true love is born out of a desperation for someone else's best case scenario and the risk that it may not come. And there is no picture of truer love than God himself taking on flesh, emptying all of the glory needed to be attained and attached to, emptying himself in order to dwell among and within and as us. And this baby is a picture of that. In Isaiah chapter nine, there are three spheres, three spheres that God directs his attention to. The first is Judah. Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. God's people, this may surprise you, God's people fractured. Now, obviously, Christians would never do that, but in the old days, God's people didn't agree with each other, and they ended up forming two separate kingdoms, the tribes to the north known as Israel, the tribes to the south, Judah. Isaiah was a prophet, a spokesman for God, to the southern kingdom people. And in chapter 7, it says that he's speaking specifically to King Ahaz, who was over the southern kingdom. But I want to show you just a verse back. I want to read this to you. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 says this, the people who walked in darkness. Let me read to you chapter 9, verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, here's why that's important. A lot of times for you and me, we zoom in at the small picture and we kind of get stuck, a little myopic. That's all we see. 
But if we take our time, as we all should, we start to zoom out to start to see a bigger picture. And as you will learn, the picture is always a little wider than our first glimpse, yeah? And this is the picture that Isaiah is doing. It is not only the land of Judah that he has in view, it is beyond that. Because these two cities, these two regions that he names are in the northern kingdom. It isn't just him talking to Judah that a light has come to just Judah, that a baby is being born just to Judah, that there's hope just for this particular people. It's zoomed out. There are people being included that maybe at first you wouldn't expect to be included, but he goes on. Not only is it those two spaces, but it's Galilee of the nations. Galilee was like a gateway for all the other nations. As a matter of fact, it's literally where most enemies came into the northern kingdom. Easy pickings. It was a gateway for the world, and this light that has come is not just for the religious, though the religious need redemption. It is not just for those who have the Bible, though those who have the Bible need the redemption. It is not just for those who have a learned background. It is for all. It expands beyond and beyond and beyond. It keeps going. And I don't know if you have people in your life that you think might be harder to include in this story, but God does not see them as harder to include in this story. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And this Jesus has come not for those who have cleaned up their act, donned the tie, worn the sweater, and attended the thing. He has come to the broken, to the lost. And here is our picture. He has come to those who walked in darkness. Now, what's interesting is that you see the word darkness occurs twice here. Everybody see that? Two different words in the Hebrew. The first one just means darkness. The people who walked or lived or had their life constantly in a lack of light, a lack of awareness, a lack of understanding, that's the first part. But now watch this. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness. Do you know where that word is seen elsewhere in the Bible? Psalm 23. This is the shadow of death. You know the King James Version, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here's where that is. And I want to give you an illustration, church, of what this is like. What Isaiah is saying is that a light has come, but he wants to describe the people who are getting access to the light. And I don't know how you see your need. Maybe some of you think you don't have a great deal of need for God to come through in certain ways or even to rescue you at all. But let me tell you how the Bible pictures me. The Bible pictures me as this kind of person. The valley of the shadow of death, this, this death's shadow, this, this word, salmaveth. Salmaveth is a Hebrew word that means trapped, so to speak, beyond the point of change. So imagine if, let's just say for the sake of, because I'm still a nine-year-old at heart and you're just going to play along. Let's pretend this is a Hot Wheels car. Men in the room, you're already with me. Ladies, try. <laughs> just try, all right? So Hot Wheels car right here, right? <laughs> Yes, I'm really doing this in a sermon. Get over it. It's fine. All right, boom. It's now over the cliff. This is what's illustrated in the shadow of death. Up here, is death possible? Yeah, not, yeah but not like really. You don't really need to think about it, right? Just stay within the lines and try to you know, avoid any of the oncoming traffic and you'll be fine, right? Out here, though, what's the possibility of death? Kind of 100%, right? Not really a 99 point anything. It's all of the things, right? This thing has one outcome because gravity seems to not fail. The car can only fail, right? This is where this is headed. This is what Isaiah the prophet is telling. This is how he describes human lives. And some of you, you feel this. Some of you are pretending and your life rhythms and you're seeking wealth and you're seeking prosperity on your own without trusting God and his provision in your life, seeking comfort by controlling the outcomes on your own. You're kind of thinking you're up here, but what the Bible seems to be convinced of throughout its entire text is you've never been here, that you've been here. And at one point in time, you're going to wake up and notice that you're here and you're going to see that this is not as good as you had thought. This is the shadow of death. And what he's saying is that this picture, where there is no hope, a light has shown, a rescue, a way out, wings on the car, so to speak, a way to finally see that this actually is not the end that it seems to perfectly be. This is where our lives are found. This is the shadow of death. It is deep darkness 
It is gloom. The only things going on in the car here are terror, loss, remorse, grief, fear, things that plague the normal in and out life of human experience over time. And what the prophet says here in chapter nine, verse two, is the people who walked in darkness, the people who couldn't see light, who lived in a land of this, a great light has, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say a light has shown us, it's a beam. Imagine walking around in complete darkness and then behind you an extraordinary one million lumens boom beam of light where now you can see everything you need to see to be safe. Now what is that? What is it? Verses three and four, he goes on. You have multiplied the nation. Now here's a big deal for you everybody. There was no real picture of this happening. The nation was sort of a dumpster fire. Remember this? That was their governmental experiences. Car over the cliff kind of way of life, right? They weren't winning much in the war. They weren't winning much in the people. They weren't winning much in the proselytizing of other cultures. Literally, the car has gone off the cliff as a culture. Sound familiar? And so they were experiencing a lack of joy, a lack of hope, a lack of everything, really. And all of a sudden, Isaiah, Isaiah is talking about this. You have multiplied the nation. Well, what, well hang on. The nation isn't Uh, he's talking about the future coming back on them. He said, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They didn't know this joy. They were longing for joy. Sound familiar? They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. I happen to have been able to grow up on a farm, and I will tell you that there is a sense of relaxation when the last of the harvest is done that is extraordinarily great. The last day that you pull the combine in and you're unloading the last of the corn or the beans, that's our context, into the, into the uh, grain bin and finishing for the season, <sighs> the restful relaxing. Now, the prices in the market may change your relaxing, but the harvest is done. And he's talking about a culture where everything that they strive for actually lands with peace, with joy. It's as if they plant the garden and the fruit tastes good. And you and I know that that's a 50-50 shot, right? Not with God, not with God. Verse four, he goes on, he continues to talk about this amazing picture. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. He's pointing back to Joshua and and this picture of, of, of not only just winning a battle, but winning a battle when the math says you are certain to lose. Certain to lose. And what Isaiah is saying is no, no. I promise you that certainty of loss isn't entirely without hope. That certainty of suffering isn't entirely without rescue. But how? How? What what is to come? He says, every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, every garment rolled in blood. Listen, these are pictures that people would have understood. We have suffered great loss. We have fought hard and we haven't fixed our life. Some of you, your marriages or your friendship or your job or your position in your family and your relationships, you have done all of the things that you know to do. Dr. Phil has carried you as far as you can go in that. And you are still languishing and longing for things to be better. You keep turning to other things. That's actually what was going on at the end of Isaiah uh, chapter eight. He says in Isaiah chapter eight, verses 19, and when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living to the teaching and to the testimony? If they will not speak according to this word, It is because they have no dawn. In the Hebrew, that have no dawn is the same concept we're talking about here. There's no light available for us to get advice from our fellow man without the light of God speaking into it. Does everybody hear that? That's the picture of Isaiah 8. The end of Isaiah 8 is railing against people who keep getting advice from necromancers. These are people that would try to talk to the dead as if the dead could murmur certain noises back and they would use that for advice and counsel on how to go through things. Isaiah 9, 5 is talking about a battle that only ends in blood, that only ends in loss. And what that picture is in the context of a people who keep looking to their own rescuing of self, their own strength, their own wisdom, their own relying on their own ideas. And Isaiah is saying, this blood 
this tramping warrior in battle tumult, all of these things that have failed and have created great loss, they will be burned as fuel. Meaning what was once hopeless will now be usable. What was once failure can now be redeemed. And you and I and all of the things that we strive in our life need redeeming. All of it needs redemption. And Jesus alone is the way. So how does this happen? It's amazing. Isaiah then pivots and he says, how? How are we going to have all of the bad things in our lives redeemed? How are we going to have all of the failures of our own trying on our own without God? How is that going to turn good? A child is born. To us, a son is given. Now, this is important because a son is not just male. A son is a particular position that is often looked to to redeem a family in its generational failures. You see, when a son is given, it's a ray of hope in a culture. If a culture had raised a family and that family did not have, per se, an heir who would take over the family name, the family lineage, the family identity, the family future, the family hope, the family would be very hopeless. The family would be here in its culture. And what God is telling Isaiah to tell the people whose life experiences are here, I'm giving you a son. I'm giving you a child. I'm giving you a hope. I'm giving you a joy. I'm giving you a way out. I'm giving you a picture. I'm giving you everything you've longed for. But let me tell you what he's going to be like. Because a lot of you, you might want certain things, but there's probably more than you can imagine coming. And it's in this. The government shall be upon his shoulder And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When I was younger, all of my relationships were centered around the idea that I could somehow feel good about me. I wanted to be seen as some sort of person that other people would esteem. I wanted to come across as smart. I wanted to come across as athletic. When I was around folks who played sports, I wanted to fit in and be among the best of them. When I was around people who were book learned, I graduated with a 1.8, easy. (laughs) I wanted to act outside of those things. When I was around some girls who were pretty, I wanted to doll up whatever hair I had at the time. I always wanted to be acceptable. When you are fully accepted by people around you, fully accepted, completely accepted, warts, baldness, and all, when you are fully, completely, and totally safe in every way, You are free the way you were created to be free. But you and I, if we're honest, and I pray that we can be this morning, we don't find it in the relationships that exist across the horizon. We strive, we fight, we dress up the outer garment as much as we can, and yet still we end our days longing for something more. Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I wanna read to you 700 years later. A word was given to people through Isaiah that said a child is born to us, a son is given, and this, this kid, he's going to be able to rule, to be a healthy king, a healthy leader, a healthy friend, a healthy advice giver, a healthy counselor who is also divine, who is also your friend. Mighty God, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, all of these things he is, 
but it isn't up to you and to me or even the people of Israel or of Judah or the nations beyond Galilee. It isn't up to them to make it happen. Who makes it happen, church? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So now we wait. Luke chapter one, Zechariah. His wife Elizabeth is with child. She's going to give birth now to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the last prophet before Jesus. Isaiah among many, now John the Baptist, the last voice, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Speaking of what is to come, Zechariah says this, blessed be the God, the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. It's come, the light has come, the darkness and the story of living in the shadow of death is no longer necessary to be seen as the only story of my reality. It is now a shadow of my reality because the light has come. The hope is here. The joy is present. I am able to be redeemed. All of my past is able to see hope. He has redeemed his, peop- redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Everybody hear that? Zechariah is pointing back to men like Isaiah saying, it's happened. He's going back 700 years to say, I don't know what you read in the paper this morning, but this is really happening and everything that it was promising is now here. You can taste this. You can have this. It's no longer something to be longed for in the future. It is able to be found now. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. What was that oath? Through you, all the nations will be blessed. And that you was Abraham. And Jesus was his seed. From the throne of David and beyond, God has made a way. Verse 74, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, talking to John the Baptist, you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. So I want to stop right there. Some of you are here. And your life experiences this a lot. There's a gloom, a deep darkness, as it were. It just kind of follows you. A sadness, a longing to be accepted, a longing to be loved, a longing to be reconciled in every way of your life to finally have its full meaning brought to your heart and your mind. No more pretending, no more faking it, no more hanging on to addictions, no more hanging on to loss, grief, mourning, or fear. Everything is able to come up like a sunshine in the morning. Dawn, dawn has come. It is able in the life of Jesus to be brought near to you even this very hour and it starts with the forgiveness of your sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. I don't know what you think of God. Someone to be feared more than anything. Someone to be seen at a distance more than anything. But Zechariah, the prophet, the father of John the Baptist, saw fit to prophesy that the way that we should think about God is within the context of someone delivering tender mercy. How do you picture him? Our God is a God of tender mercy. I'm gonna have the team to help sing come back up while we finish this verse, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Does everybody see that? In Luke chapter one, the prophet Zechariah is pointing back to a conversation that Isaiah had long ago to a people whose daily life was just always in the darkness of trying to fit in, trying to be accepted, trying to be made much of, trying to find victory, trying to find hope, all of these things without God's provision, all of these things on their own. And Zechariah finishes his prophecy by saying to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
Church at Maine, do you think the world that you spend your time in outside of this building, do you think it needs peace? Just answer out loud now. Do you think the family members who you love and cherish and have prayed for and longed would have joy in their life, do you think that they really need peace? Do you have this peace? Did you hear the change? You aren't sure. Why not? It's come. It's real. And as we finish our time here this morning, I'm gonna beg you, use this moment more than any other in your past, whether you think you're a believer or not a believer or unsure of how to label, ditch all of that. And in this moment, captivate your attention on this tender mercy of the living God. Church at Maine, do you believe he loves you? Do you trust that he loves you? then do you have his peace within you? Then you leaving this place today means that your feet have a direction. What's that direction? The way of peace. So let me show you what that looks like in John chapter one, verses five, verse nine, verse 11, I'm sorry, 12 and 13. The light shines in darkness. Everybody close your eyes. I want you to think right now, top of your head, what is the darkest place in your life? It could be an addiction of yours. It could be something a friend is struggling with. It could be something your spouse is struggling with, your friend is struggling with, your parents are struggling with, maybe even you yourself today. What is the darkest thing in your reality? What is it? Picture it right now. Who is it? Now, right now, I'm gonna ask you, I want you to pray over that. I want you to pray that that darkness is destroyed by the beam of light that is the love of Jesus Christ. A love that forgives every sin, that keeps no record of wrong, that provides peace in the day of darkness. Are you prepared now? Will you pray right now in your seat that God will vanquish that particular darkness, whether it's in your life or in the life of someone you care about? Right now, pray. Heavenly Father, as we captivate our attention toward these these areas of darkness in the lives of those we care about or in our own life, we are asking that you would please shine your light and give us strength, give us wisdom now, right now, to recognize our opportunity. If you are living inside of us, then we have the opportunity to shine your light into that darkness. Tell us what to do today. For their sake and for your name's sake, move us in the way of peace toward the people or our own issues that we may walk in light. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Darkness has not overcome Jesus. Everything else in this world, darkness works to fight. Darkness doesn't have a foothold on Jesus. If you have any question about that, He rose from the grave and is still physically alive and active and moving and able and is returning again. He is coming back fully bodily, fully coming back. This is God's story. And whatever it is you're afraid of, whatever you think has great power, nothing has greater power than darkness except the light of Jesus Christ. God has made a way where there is no other way. Whatever addiction you're fighting, whatever proclivities you carry, whatever weaknesses you are suffering from, I assure you the light of Jesus' love for you, through you, and certainly over you for the remainder of your time. He alone is able, and you have this by faith, not by working and doing anything magical or changing how you dress, or atta- it is by faith. Do you trust that he loves you, that he has come for you, that he has brought this light into your life through no merit of your own, no keeping of a sacrament, no working of a thing, but just by faith in Jesus' perfect love, beginning in time past, brought through to a manger beyond the cross to the grave to the throne the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. But to all who did not receive him, who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. The baby has come 
The baby has come for his family. By faith alone, you belong to him. Merry Christmas, church at Maine. The light shines in darkness. Wherever you're going today, carry him for them, for us all.